The motets um, are really so special in Bach's oeuvre because here he's not having to toe a party line over the choice of a libretto. He, he can choose the text that he wants himself. He's not having to deal with another librettist because most of them are, well, they are all, apart from the final chorale in one case, uh, they're all taken from the Bible. And they are usually funerary in the sense that even when the music tells you of joy and, and singing to the Lord a new song and the, and the, the, the aspirations towards a, a heavenly choir, they are actually there to console the bereaved after, after a loss. Um, that's the bulk of them anyway. Um, and they, are, they, they seem to have a unique place in Bach's oeuvre because they demand incredible qualities of the singers. They demand stamina, they demand incredible agility and uh, sort of acrobatic agility. Uh, I mean, he makes no concessions to voices. They have to function as fast as a, as a violin a bow on strings or, or an oboe um, or a trumpet indeed. Then the fact that uh, several of them are for double choir creates this wonderful antiphony which brings one back to the great models of the Venetians, for instance, the Gabrielis, and then the way that was translated into Germany uh, by Hans-Leo Hassler and by Schutz, and Bach takes it on a stage um, further. So there's tremendous physical energy um, in the interplay of the eight voices. Um, the continuo is there as a support, but it, it, they, could, they can be performed without continuo or with instrumental doubling. And it's a tremendous workout for a choir, and it's, it, it, for a conductor, you have to be so alert to every tiny nuance and, and, and balance of these eight voices. I mean, it's like, um, uh, it's like an aer um, a, a display of aeronautical display it's at Farnborough or something, where the, with these incredible jets going overhead and not colliding and making sure that they're all perfectly aligned. That's, that's your job as a conductor.